Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for Government's Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government. I'm Gavin Freegard, Programme Director for Data and Digital Government, and it's wonderful to welcome, if not actually be able to see, so many of you this evening. This is our ninth Data Bytes event, um, but also the Institute's first ever live online only event. I would say it's a novel experience presenting without getting any audience feedback and having nobody to laugh at my jokes, but let's be honest, that's what happens at every Data Bytes event. Now, as regular attenders, uh, will, attendees will know, I usually start by asking who's been before and who hasn't, and I see no reason to change that tonight. So hands up if this is your first Data Bytes event. Great, you're very welcome. And hands up if you've been before. Brilliant. I hope you're getting some perplexed looks from family members and flatmates uh, right now. Um, those who've been before will also be pleased to see that our famous countdown timer is available online, but you'll also be pleased to know that I've got my own version of it right here as well to keep me on track. So I'm just going to share my screen with all of you and uh, start with some housekeeping. So uh, we are on the record this evening and being live streamed, obviously. Uh, if you'd like to join in on Twitter, the hashtag is hashtag IFG Data Bytes, and we're also live tweeting at IFG events. And we will be putting questions to our presenters uh, this evening, and there are two ways that you can do that. First, I'll be keeping an eye on the IFG Data Bytes hashtag, but you can also submit questions anonymously via Slido. Go to bit.ly slash Slido DB9. So make sure you get your questions in there. Now, since we may have some first timers tonight, um, I'll start with a quick rundown of what Data Bytes is and how it works. Um, through all of the work that the Institute for Government does on data, we re realized there was a real need uh, to bring together all sorts of people working on very different data and digital projects across government. We wanted to show people who don't think of themselves as being in the weeds of data, what better data can actually mean in practice for them. And given that we spend quite a lot of time pointing out what's wrong with government data, we wanted to celebrate uh, some of the best practice and put that on the record for lots of people to be able to learn from. Um, this is quite a different format uh, to a lot of our other events. Uh, this is how it's going to work. You're going to hear four presentations on very different data projects. Each of our speakers will have eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes. There's that timer again. Uh, there are eight bits in a byte, hence there are eight minutes in a data byte. Uh, once the presenter has finished their eight minutes, uh, they'll then face eight minutes of Q&A. Um, and I'll start that timer going as soon as I ask them the first question. So again, do get your questions in via Twitter and Slido. And once they've taken uh, eight minutes of questions, we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, if, uh, if you'd like to see um, our previous Data Bytes events, you can go to the uh, link on screen now. Um, now, as I said, this is our ninth event. Um, so because eight is such an important number for us, uh, we've celebrated the first eight courses of our gourmet tasting menu, as one of my colleagues put it, uh, by publishing a report uh, today. It's got contributions from all 36 people who've presented about 32 different projects, um, but it also gave us the opportunity to draw out some key themes. Now, what were those themes? Well, we found that the sharing of data across government, which can lead to better public services, better policy making, and generally more effective government, is straightforward, secure, and widespread. That's in part thanks to high data quality across government, where different data sets can talk to each other because they use very consistent standards and identifiers. And all of that means that data is being used to its full potential across government. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Happy April Fool's Day, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I think it'd be fair to say that in drawing out those themes, um, we did find that there's still a great deal of room for improvement in how government uses data. One of the questions that we asked all of our presenters to date uh, was if they could change one thing about data and government, what would it be? I quite like this answer from Simon Worthington, who spoke at our second Data Bytes event. Wow, only one thing. It is worth remembering, though, that we have come quite a long way and have achieved uh, quite a lot. Again, I like this from Adam Locker, who presented our sixth Data Bytes event. Uh, it's good to remind ourselves about how far we've come in that time. 
Um, do take some time to go to our website and uh, devour that report. There's lots in there, um, including this wonderful quote from Yvonne Gallagher at the National Audit Office about an elephant which will need to be bitten off in chunks. I don't think supermarket supply chains have quite got to that stage yet. Um, but as I said, do devour that report like your mountain goats overrunning a Welsh seaside town. Now, regular attendees will also know I usually take the opportunity to talk about some of the Institute's work um, and what we've been up to on data since the previous Data Bytes event. The last Data Bytes event was in February. I think it'd be fair to say that quite a lot has happened since then. If there are weeks when decades happen, I think March has felt more like a geological era. Um, this Lenin quote is very much the highbrow version. We have an internet version as well, for those of you who speak meme. If it weren't for the events of the last couple of weeks, I may have concentrated on the cabinet reshuffle, where uh, dramatic events included the unexpected resignation of the Chancellor, Sajid Javid. That happened just 47 days ago. Or I might have focused on changes at the top of the civil service with new permanent secretaries being appointed. You may remember Philip Rutnam, the Home Office permanent secretary, dramatically resigned not so long ago. That was 32 days ago. Of course, since then, all of the charts that we've become used to seeing are much more sober and much more somber, looking at the spread of COVID-19, including this one from the Financial Times, underlining the importance of using and properly communicating data at a time of crisis, a theme I've no doubt that we will return to over the coming weeks and months. And it's actually with coronavirus that we start tonight. And our first presentation will come from Kirsten Mulcahy at the social investment business, talking about how charities and others can better use social economy data to understand which communities may be most vulnerable at the time of COVID-19. We were then hoping to hear from John Harrison, the Department for Work and Pensions. Unfortunately, owing to government guidelines around coronavirus, he's had to pull out. We look forward to listening to him soon. Instead, we'll go straight to our next speaker, Harin Chowdhury, the Director of Evidence at the Office of the Children's Commissioner. Uh, they're doing some really good work around data to understand childhood vulnerability. Our third presentation will be Tony Basu from the Open Government Partnership. She'll be talking about open data through a gender lens and again why that's particularly important in times of crisis. And stepping in at the last moment, I'm delighted to welcome my brilliant colleague Alice Lilly, who will be talking about three lessons she's learned from parliamentary data the hard way. Our next event, all being well with the technology, will be on Wednesday the 6th of May. Um, those of you who've been before will know that a key part of Data Bytes is the drinking and networking afterwards. Um, do join us for a virtual drink. Um, I will give you details at the end of the event about how you can join that and we'll see how well all of that works. We are looking to do this uh, monthly, uh, the first Wednesday of every month. So if you would like to pitch a presentation or know somebody who should, please do get in touch with me. Uh, we are always looking for sponsors to keep the series going. Um, if you've got any ideas or would be interested in supporting event, an event, please do get in touch with my colleague, Pratesh. And that's all I've got to say by way of introduction. So, as I said, our first speaker today is Kirsten from the social investment business. So while we reset the timer and uh, get Kirsten on screen, uh, the timer will start as soon as Kirsten is ready. So Kirsten, thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Sure. Let me just share my screen and get this up. Are we all, is, I'm hoping that everyone can see that. And I am going to get started. So I've started my timer. I've got eight minutes. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about social economy data and how we've been using it to um, try and identify those communities most vulnerable to the impact of COVID-19. So we all know that data um, can be particularly helpful in effectively prioritizing limited resources. And the social sector has been mobilizing our data teams to do just that in order to identify communities that we think are most vulnerable. Um, this is a live project, so I am sh sharing with you um, where we are to date, and there's much more to come. We are a multi-stakeholder um, project, so we're dealing with a lot of um, different partners in this work, and we're sharing data openly, partnering widely, and working very collaboratively. The five main aims of our, our project are essentially the first is to provide real-time data to indicate changing economic vulnerability while the crisis continues to unfold using that real-time data to then identify vulnerable communities 
drill a little bit deeper to understand the impact that is that's having on local economies um, and civil society infrastructure and whether or not they're able to sustain the crisis and bring all that together to hopefully inform and direct um, short-term interventions for emergency resources um, and also longer-term interventions that people such as ourselves, social investors, are particularly interested in taking forward in future. So we know that data right now um, is an immediate need. We know that we're dealing with a crisis. So we're trying to get started as quickly as possible. And we're using Oxkey's 206 left behind wards. They've already identified those, identified those that are particularly um, economically vulnerable and essentially have been left behind. So starting with those 206, we know that community vulnerability is broken up, up into a number of different components, um, but we will be focusing on economic vulnerability to start. We are then prioritizing the first output on really fast, responsive, and easily accessible data. So our main aim for the first output is to create an economic um, health barometer, where essentially we would have every left behind ward um, and four economic health indicators that we update the da data weekly so we can have a live tracking of how local economies are faring during the corona crisis. Um, the four indicators that we've identified are leading indicators in terms of what we think might in influence changing economic um, growth in future. The first three relate to consumption or, or consumer spending. And the fourth one is relating to those that we think might start to apply for benefits in future. This is also, a, you know, this is the first output of our project. Um, but the, we, in future, we are wanting to get to the kind of uh, more longer pay, longer term paper and deeper data analysis. For now, we're really prioritizing fast, responsive, and easily accessible data. So how are we doing this? Well, we're re relying critically on two data sets from two partners. The first is from Impoku, who has car transaction data or spend level data that has been compiled on a, on daily, um, at a daily level at, at split by ward. So we can essentially see where people are spending their money um, through card transactions. They've compiled that across six different card and, and bank sources and, all, and kind of added demographic data, et cetera, before we get that information. We are then also um, supported by Turn to Us, who has data on their benefits calculator. So essentially, they hold a benefits calculator online that anyone can go through um, and, and answer the surveys to figure out whether or not they qualify for benefits. Um, both of those data sets are really pertinent in, in helping us understand what those four key variables are and how we can track those weekly as we update our barometer um, as soon as we can with the data um, available. So while the output that we're looking for will be split by ward level, the things I'm going to present now are essentially um, on aggregate level. So what have we found so far? We looked at sales, so card data, looking at smirch at customer spend over the last two weeks and compared that to a two week benchmark that we compiled creating spend data or card data over the last two years. We then compared our left behind places with an affluent comparison group that we created, so kind of the richer areas, and then had a little look to see what changed. Um, as expected, we saw that grocery sales have increased in the short term, I think we all know that we've been to the shops a bit more. Um, there was a slightly bigger influence in increase in more affluent areas and other sales, so sales spent in other sectors, not grocery, um, experienced a drop. We th had a hunch that there might be um, some sort of localization effect that might result from the stay at home initiative. So we might have more people spending, spending and using cards within a one mile radius of where they live due to the fact that everyone's staying at home. The data didn't actually show that. You can see that there across the wards in both of the places, there is a um, kind of 0% uh, difference there that's been seen um, between expected spend and current localized spend on groceries in particular, with a couple of outliers in our left behind wards. We've also found that the, over the last two weeks, the actual value of a basket of people um, of spend has increased. Um, that has been the same increase, actually both 11% increase compared to um, the, for the benchmark compared to the current. So, um, uh, sorry, the, um, the left behind places compared to our more affluent areas. We've also found that um, our target areas, which are left behind places, are spending a higher proportion of their total incomes on necessities like groceries. Um, and that's only been further exacerbated with when we look at spending over the last two weeks, weeks kind of that, that influencing factor of corona. Um, when we looked at the benefit barometer calculator, we could see that there was um, that kind of individuals across the whole country were feeling particularly vulnerable economically and searching for more information online. So after the chancellor's speech on the, on the 17th, we saw a 234% increase um, in people accessing the Turn to Us um, benefits calculator, which is quite staggering. 
Um, if we hone in on those left behind wards, you can see kind of following a similar spike towards the later days of March. Um, and then those the lighter blue lines showing those that are actually qualifying for um, that for, for benefits according to their survey results. Obviously, this is a survey, so it's indicating information, people seeking information, and that might lead to behavior change. There's also a lot of informational data out there, obviously, on, on universal credit applications that have already have some, some, some information to, to feed in. What we are so interested in, though, in our barometer are leading indicators, and which is why we're so interested in this benefits calculator um, as an as ability to lead into the fact that many more will be applying for benefits in future in these areas. So what is this saying? Essentially, it's saying that we think at the moment we need to really be tracking the economic health of our local communities because we feel that there could be a bit of a perfect storm brewing. We know that increasing number of people are going to move into benefits soon. There's going to be less income available for circulation in economies. The, the um, localization of spending effect that we thought might happen actually hasn't really happened. There has been an increased spike in grocery sales. Um, but we need to our barometer to check weekly whether or not that is sustained in um, those left behind areas or whether or not that tails out as, as income becomes more constrained. Um, and all of this in, in importance to, to identify that the left behind places might have a higher propensity but to become trapped in a negative economic spiral. And really we need to be a step ahead and start to addressing before we get to that point. So that's where we are, but there's still lots more to do. And I just wanna quickly show you two things that we're trying to consider in terms of local economic infrastructure. There's so much more to this project to come. So the first bit is to really understand while we see the, the crunch on consumers and constrained income spending, um, we also need to double check what, eco what the economic infrastructure is within those current wards and whether or not with the constrained um, income can income vulnerability and reduced spending, whether or not they can endure and or survive the, the COVID-19 crisis. So just one example, zooming in again, not using Infoku data on Wingfield, which is a left behind ward. We know they had a conservative hold with quite a, um, with about a population of 12,000 and they had 109 people accessing the calculator and their income groups are, are particularly are, are the more vulnerable um, and they also have slightly um, younger age groups. So that's just a bit of a population um, reflection. What we need to look at now is really what merchants are in that area and whether or not those high streets with those merchants are going to survive during this, this crisis, both in the short term and the long term. Um, and obviously using that to inform any interventions that we might want to want to be placing into these left behind areas. So just quickly to look, um, there's three three areas of uh, three merchants there that we've reflected. Um, I know my time is up and the next real important part is how all of this is getting used. So we are trying to get out our daily, daily data as quickly as possible and work on our more holistic long-term piece um, for a little bit longer, but hopefully getting that to you soon as well. Questions? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kirsten. Um, if you would like to ask Kirsten a question, please do uh, submit it via the IFG, hashtag, uh, IFG Data Bytes hashtag or use our Slido, um, which uh, you can find uh, via my Twitter. Um, as well. Um, so we do have a few questions to kick off with. Uh, Kirsten, I hope you can mm -hmm. hear me okay. Um, so I'll start with one of the questions we've had via Slido, Kirsten. Um, mm. Why was the turn to us source used? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't something like Citizens Advice or Gov.uk be a more universally used source? Uh, so that's one question. And a second question from Slido, uh, how, how the wards have been set um, in the left behind area? The ward set and left behind here, sure. So, I mean, I think I think our first one um, turned to us data was is particularly useful because it's um, acting as a leading indicator. And I know some of the data contained kind of on citizens advice or Gov UK could be similar in the sense that it's it's identifying those that are looking for information, which would then lead to hopefully some sort of behavior change and then into actual getting of benefits. So it's giving us a little bit of a leading indicator of what might change. Um, to be honest, it was around access accessing the data as soon as possible. Um, and turned to us have a big data set. So, I mean, you can see from the UK, um, the number there, I think there was over a million, or well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, definitely it was 200 in a space of, 250 in a space of a week, people that actually accessed their, their calculator. So that was a significantly large sample size and they were able to send us and kind of share with us some partner data at award level um, to, to substantiate. But I think moving forward, honestly, the more data, the merrier that we can try and expand upon would, would be very helpful. And um, for us, time was was particularly critical for this project. Excellent. Um, another question that I've had uh, sent to me. 
Um, mm -hmm. I suppose, how do you separate out the effect of uh, COVID-19 from sort of other factors? That can't be particularly easy. Yeah. And yeah. so far, have you found people being very willing to share data with you? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, and I realized I didn't answer that left behind ward. So um, Oxkey had classified those already. So those 206 wards we took from kind of their very robust data, I encourage everyone to read the method. It was really very sound and they drew on multiple or numerous data sources to establish what those 206 were. So that was kind of a steer straight away to get us information and, and out and, and getting um, what is needed fast. Um, I think, I mean, to be honest, the attribution versus contribution um, question around COVID-19 creating the spike versus other fa other influencing factors, um, that's important from a kind of more academic perspective, but I think we're also trying to be quite practical and realistic. And our main aim is that during crisis, we need data and we need data now, we need it tomorrow. And obviously we want good data and robust data and we don't want to, you know, there might be some, some influencing spikes there. Um, but then FOCU data is itself cleaned to, um, so if there's any inconsistencies in spend or merchant churn, churn to some degree, if they can pick up any of those spikes that are incorrect in the data, they will clean them themselves um, as fast as, as possible. Um, but ultimately, um, we are aiming for a contribution narrative because we need to know quickly where to direct resources. Um, and I think looking at a two week period, given the timeline of COVID, um, I think it's quite a, a realistic um, contribution narrative, although we cannot be clear on attribution yet, of course. Um, the next one was willingness of sharing. Um, unbelievably so. Um, we've really been bowled away at the at the willingness of everyone we've spoken to to try and support in the best way that they can, whether it be sharing data openly, um, sharing of resource, sharing of systems um, and processing power and, and like uh, data analysts and access to different data sources. Um, I think that we've seen really a, an overwhelming um, response from the social economy data players that we've engaged with and we hope to engage with more. So if there's any of you out there, please do get in touch, the more the merrier. Um, but it's really, it's really been unbelievably encouraging. Excellent. Um, we're getting some really good questions in via Slido. Mm. So those of you on Twitter, do, do, do get involved. Um, so Sarah asks, can the data be disaggregated by sex or other protected characteristics so we can learn whether this is having a disproportionate impact on particular groups? Yeah. And uh, let's also go with a question from Anonymous, who's wondering, is there an issue with the fact that credit card use is not evenly distributed across uh, richer and poorer wards? Yeah. Yeah, so the first one, I think that's a, it's a really excellent question and it would be, you know, really important to start um, d drilling down into if we can get into the individual level. At the moment, for GDPR purposes, all of the data that we have is not on individual person, it's not personalised data. We see kind of card spend and where it was spent we know which merchants they spent at but you don't i mean I, do, I can't identify myself in the data for example i mean that's for gdpr purposes but i think that once we if we could get other data to start to overlay and look more closely in these wards there's certainly some demographic information that is available at a ward level so we can start to say you know, what do the income categories look like? What type of age groups are there? Um, we can look at things, uh, kind of what type of, um, I've looked at employment vulnerability. So whether people are part-time, flexible working, et cetera. So we can start to build in all of those demographic calculations. Um, certainly, and I think that's a very useful um, next step for us as well. Um, Credit card data, yes. So um, the Mfoku data, um, Ad I asked Adam qu this question yesterday because I knew someone was going to ask it, but basically um, looks at around 13% to 33% of the total universe of card spend. Um, and that also is the case where you don't necessarily have, so even, I mean, even actually in wealthy areas, London markets, for example, that's a highly cash-based economy. Um, so we'll never be able to track all of that. But for us, what's most interesting is not actually around the actual the value, but it's around the change because we're looking at weekly and daily changes um, and people who are using cards at Sainsbury's today and tomorrow and two weeks ago are likely to use that same card again. So the behavior change in terms of using cards or using cash um, isn't as likely, but certainly there will be a whole group of kind of cash based merchants that are not reflected in this data. Um, but what what we are hoping is that the car using card transactions will give us an understanding of the percentage change where grocery spikes are seeing seeing where other sectors are dropping down 
where grocery might have spiked in the short term and, and um, left behind places, and then whether or not that might actually start to peter out when people have spent money that was proper savings, where those affluent areas that type of um, grocery spend might maintain. Um, so that's where that barometer is really, really interesting because we've seen those sports short term spikes now, but really the real question is what happens next week and the week after that. Um, Excellent. As it happens, uh, Jeremy via Slider asked, do you know what caused the spikes in the local uh, local shopping data in Harder wards? Um, I'll put a couple of other sort of linked questions to you as well, and um, both about sort of local authorities. Uh, John asks, what level of geographic disaggregation could a local council get this information at and how? Yeah. And Harper mm -hmm. asks, how much attention interest um, is coming from local authorities and others who could be involved in relieving these issues? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, we, we have disaggregated on ward level. Um, I believe, so Infoku has definitely got postcode district level. Um, and I do need to double check if it has postcode, but ward, there's like 9,300, 9,500 wards um, in the UK. So that is quite, quite a smaller geography. Um, the benefits calculator can obviously get to postcode level, but that starts to have a little protection. There's protection of privacy air, um, concerns there, so we've we've aggregated that back up toward. Um, but certainly, the the more detailed and nuanced we can get to the to the lower levels, the, the more helpful the data will be. So we're going to continue looking into that. Interest wise, we updated the data today, so um, we needed this before we could kind of start to leverage and go further. We have some interest in terms of media and news platforms who are looking who are, who would be excited to house our barometer, um, and hopefully we could make that um, as accessible as possible to everyone. But the idea is that really anyone and everyone and anyone out there who would like this data and think it might be helpful, that we would be more than willing to share. This is the whole purpose of us of us kind of doing the work to date. So please do get in touch. <laughs> Just to say, Kirsten, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Rambo clocked down perfectly as well. And um, as you said, if anybody uh, does want to get uh, want to learn more or get involved, they should get in touch with you. Is that right? Yes, please do. My email is on the slides. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, our next speaker this evening uh, will be Haroon Chowdhury from the Office of the Children's Commissioner. So hopefully. Haroon will uh, appear on screen any moment now. And can you see uh, me? when he is ready, we can indeed. Hello, Haroon, how are you doing? Hi, hi, I'm very well, Gavin, how are you? Brilliant, I'm not too bad, uh, thank you very much. This this actually seems to be working. I probably shouldn't have said that because now everything will uh, fall, fall apart. But um, Haroon, I will now leave the floor to you. Um, and as soon as you're ready, the timer will start. Great. Uh, let me just try and share my uh, screen. <coughs> All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about how we at the Children's Commissioner's Office are using uh, data to better understand childhood vulnerability. Uh, what do I mean by child, better understand childhood vulnerability exactly? Um, we are trying to answer two key questions. Uh, first of which is, one, how many vulnerable children are there in England? Which sounds like a very simple question, but is actually quite difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. Second question is, how many of these uh, children are getting help and how many are not? How many are falling through the gaps, as we like to say? <coughs> In order to answer these two questions, we launched uh, three years ago our annual study of childhood vulnerability, which aims to assess the numbers on how many children we think are vulnerable, uh, provide all of the data in one place, uh, establish a common framework for government, academia, researchers and other institutions to use, identify gaps in data and also gaps in services and support, and to support debate on the really big questions, the strategic questions for local and national governments like uh, do we have enough resources and support and structures and systems in place to support vulnerable children? <coughs> All of the uh, material that I'm going to talk you through is available on our website on this link. Um, and I should say, uh, especially given the previous uh, presentation, that this is all pre coronavirus. Uh, this is all kind of retrospective data, but, uh, but it's still relevant. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how right at the end. 
First of all, in order to talk about vulnerability, we first have to define what we mean by vulnerability. And so the very first thing that we did was to look across all of the different <coughs> definitions of vulnerability. What do we? What does vulnerability mean? It turns out if you do that, if you scan across all of the different policy areas uh, and domains, uh, you get about 70 different lists of uh, definitions of, of vulnerability. And on our, at the bottom of this screen, uh, the link here at the bottom, if you can see that, the, the, we actually have a table with all 70 different definitions of vulnerability. <coughs> here is just a very simplified view of seven different themes to give you a, a basic flavor. And you'll see that it covers all sorts of things uh, from the child protection system to children who have health issues, to children who are living with adults where the adults are vulnerable, uh, to children who face risks outside of the home, and even children who, are ris who face risks because of things like immigration status or nationality. In assembling all of this data, we have identified two major issues. Uh, the first is that it's really difficult to get data on prevalence, by which I mean levels of need within the population, as opposed to just caseloads and, and, and uh, numbers of children interacting with the system. <clears throat> so things like uh, children who are exposed to domestic violence or uh, experiencing criminal exploitation or experiencing abuse but not known to social care services, those things like that, that kind of under the radar levels of vulnerability, really difficult to measure and estimate. The other thing is that even where we can get a good measure of particular vulnerability, we're often interested in multiple vulnerabilities. Uh, children who are exposed to two or more types of vulnerabilities or three or more types of vulnerabilities and that's when things really start to fall apart in terms of what we can say <coughs> and what we can estimate. A good example is uh, children who are exposed to domestic abuse within the household and have parents who have a mental health issue and have parents who have uh, substance misuse. Now, in, in social policy, that's that's called the toxic trait. It's very difficult to estimate that because it's three different things, uh, each of which is individually difficult to estimate. But there are other examples as well. For example, <coughs> in relation to... Uh, serious violence uh, and the, the crime and justice agenda. If you wanted to know how many children are excluded from school and come from a household where domestic violence was an issue, we can't answer that question. The, it involves two separate answers that live in different data sets. And so we, we're constantly having to resolve the challenge of, of data that comes from different areas trying to fill in these gaps. Uh, through better data <coughs> and through linking data. One example I'm going to talk about here is uh, on the toxic trio that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, we've used survey data, um, which asks adults about all three issues and about whether they have children in the household and, and about how many children there are in order to produce our own estimates, which we believe are the first national estimates of the numbers of children who are living in households with uh, where these issues are present. We estimate that uh, <clears throat> about 2.1 million children live in a household where at least one of these issues is present and 100,000 children live in a household where all of these issues are present. Those are national figures. Over the last year, we've been trying to translate that into local authority figures to make this really useful to local authorities. And so <clears throat> we now have uh, modelled predictions uh, for each local authority and for each parliamentary constituency of what the prevalences of these issues are for each uh, local area of the country. And the data for that and the maps for that are available on our website at that link below. So does that mean we can say how many vulnerable children there are? Well, uh, it doesn't. <coughs> across, ag aggregating across 70 different groups is, uh, is an almost impossible task. It will take us a very, very long time to get there. What we can do is aggregate across uh, five or six or seven groups uh, in a meaningful way. So, for example, we can talk about the number of children who are vulnerable because of a family issue. They are, they are from a vulnerable family background. And uh, here we define that as being the aggregate of these seven separate groups. And after doing some calculations to take into account what we think are the overlaps between those groups, because we don't want to double count or triple count, <coughs> we, we estimate that that's about 2.3 million children in England. Uh, which is quite a lot. Uh, that's uh, about one in six children. Going back to the start, 
we don't just want to know how many children they are. We also want to know how many of these children are getting support. When we do that exercise, <coughs> well, we know from data on children's social care um, that about 128,000 children are on, child care, uh, are, are on a child protection plan or are on child in care. About another 270,000 are on a child in need plan. That's about 400,000 children altogether. We also know that uh, some children are in families supported by the Troubled Families Program. On top of uh, children's social care, that's about another 270,000 children. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we are now at about 670,000 children. However, there's about another 700,000 children who are not who are no children's services put on the radar but not really getting anything <clears throat> and now we've really exhausted all of the uh all of the kind of the, the levers of, of local services that still leaves a residual of about eight hundred thousand children these are children who are not even known to local services let alone getting any support <clears throat> that's a very quick rundown of our findings in terms of where we want to go next with this uh, we are putting this data in the hands of local authorities to help them understand how they can better use data, uh, how they can get a better view of the local needs within their area. We want them to use these in their in their assessments of local need. We are pushing, uh, we're pushing forward uh, to improve data linking. That's a really key thing. Uh, we are working with ONS uh, and government and others to, uh, to to create a step change in the in the in the way that uh, administrative departments share data with each other. We also want to improve what is measured. You know, a real problem here is, is that uh, too much of what we want to know isn't measured in the first place, and that's where we need uh, new data. And finally, just to bring it back to coronavirus, as I said, this is all pre-coronavirus. However, we are finding that it is actually very useful. into crisis as a result of income shocks or family stress or things like that as a result of coronavirus. And so this data has been very useful <clears throat> in order to help un uh, government understand, well, what is the baseline and who are the families that need help uh, before coronavirus strikes? That is all I will say. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And here is uh, some information about us if you would like to find out more. Thank you very much indeed, Haroon. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, if you'd like to submit any questions to Haroon or our other speakers, uh, you can use hashtag IFG Data Bytes or go to our Slido, which is bit.ly slash Slido DB9. And in fact, um, I'm going to start with a question from the Slido. Um, Emma asks, people don't self-identify as vulnerable because the term itself uh, can be stigmatising. So how statistically valid do you think the survey data can be considering that? <coughs> That's a very good question. So uh, none of these data sources ask, are you vulnerable? Um, they would be, uh, they wouldn't get anywhere if they did that. What happens is that these, these are surveys um, through sort of trained researchers, lots of testing of survey questions um, in a safe environment um, and often anonymous where uh, the person asking the question um, can't see, I mean, you, you're, you'll be sat usually in front of a computer. Um, there is a supervisor, they can't see what you're putting in, they can't even see what question you're answering. <clears throat> and it's all about strict confidentiality. Uh, and then we use standard measures where we ask, has this ever happened to you? Has that ever happened to you? How would you rate your feelings or your well-being on this scale? Um, it's we can never guarantee that we get uh, you know perfect response, so that we can never completely eliminate the possibility of stigma. But but the, but these there is a kind of a rich history of trying to answer these questions in a in a in a way that elicits meaningful answers. And so uh, as a result of that, I think we can have rich uh, high high level of confidence uh, in the in the in that survey data. Um, so we're currently um, working on a report, as, as I think you know, um, that's sort of looking at some of the missing data around sort of children's services. Um, to what extent um, could government be making better use of administrative data as well as survey data? And how do those sort of things fit together in all of this? That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, a really important question to answer. <coughs> I, think, um, I think there are two key priorities. The first is better data on who are the children that need children's social care. Um, now, the children's social care system has great data on the children within the system. Um, it has 
really no real data on the children who need children's social care or who need children's services, that data is going to sit within the education system. It's going to sit within health visitors. Uh, it's going to sit within um, adult services, uh, police data, um, housing department data, uh, particularly things like housing related issues. It's going to sit within Department for Work and Pensions as well. <clears throat> so really, those are the places that you want to go to in order to understand well, who are the children and how many children are there who need support from children's services and the children's social care system. Now, the other thing is outcomes. Um, how do we know whether the children, how, how do we know whether children's services are doing well? How do we know whether children's social care is doing well? <clears throat> really, um, it's very good at measuring system level outcomes, like does a case escalate? Uh, does a case get passed from one team of social workers to another? It doesn't really measure how well are children doing? Are they leading normal, happy, successful lives? That means getting data not just on education attainment. It means getting data on, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, health and well-being. Uh, it means getting data on transitions into adulthood through things like uh, earnings, uh, whether the child children are neat or not. And finally, I think it means getting data on involvement in the criminal justice system. Which, so again, lots of opportunities there for linked data to give us a much richer picture of whether the children's uh, services to the system is meeting the right children and achieving the right things for them. I suppose in, in terms of linking all of that data um, between different government departments, between different public services, um, some people would be worried about the sort of privacy and other ethical implications of that. What do you think can be sort of done to, to mitigate that? <coughs> That's a great question. Um, uh, the, I suppose the, the, the important way in here, which is, which is how, it's, how it's been used um, thus far, is to emphasise that this is... I mean, as 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 all of as all, as my presentation showed, this was really about um, research purposes uh, to inform str uh, strategic conversations. Uh, I think where the privacy lobby tends to worry is around kind of targeting algorithms, <clears throat> making operational decisions in relation to a specific child or or a particular family, stigmatizing things like that. Um, and this is a level of abstraction away from that. This is just to inform the broader strategic conversation of how many children need what help. Do we even have a grip on the issues facing the system? Do we even are we even able to answer the question of whether the systems have enough money and are reaching the right uh, right numbers of children? And we don't uh, because of uh, because of these issues around data linking. We can use data linking to better answer those questions without uh, doing the kind of micro level infringements that people might be worried about. Great. Um, so we've got just over two and a half minutes left. Again, if anybody does want to get a question into Haroon, you can do it via hashtag IFG Databytes or on our Slido as well. Um, I'm going to ask you one of the sort of big questions that we ask all of our speakers. Um, and in fact, a lot of those answers ended up in the report we published today, which is if you could change one thing about the data that would make uh, your job easier, uh, what would it be? Um, that is a great question. I think um, uh, I'm going to sound a bit Orwellian here, but I think it would be great if there was just one uh, indicator, uh, sorry, one unique identifier for, for children or families, maybe the NHS number or something like that, <clears throat> which all departments used. Um, and other countries do this. Uh, you know, it's not it's not mad or bizarre or crazy. Other countries do this. Um, they have. They say, okay, this is your ID, um, and every, and every department in the trucks says you have to use that ID. So I suppose why why do you think those things haven't happened? What are the what are the sort of hurdles and barriers to to better data on this front? Well, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, I do think it part of it is is departmental silos. Um, I, I do think we have a we have uh, and particularly in relation to children uh, this is really really a, a huge problem in relation to children where <clears throat> we don't have one department that is that has overall responsibility for children um, unlike in, in other countries we have a department that's responsible for children's health we have another department that's responsible for children's education we have another department that's responsible for children's safety uh, and child protection we have another department that's responsible for 
for children in relation to the criminal justice system. We have another department that's responsible for children in uh, ensuring that uh, children's material needs uh, and benefits are, are being provided. So there's already five different departments there that all have a focus on children. Children's needs don't fit squarely within one department. Uh, but the but the data on them is is all compartmentalized in this way. So <clears throat> I do think we have having more having more kind of ministerial uh, oversight specifically around children. I think that would be a key thing. Then there are things around uh, culture change, uh, technological progress, getting uh, you're making sort of uh, civil servants and people involved in these arts to be sort of more data savvy, more tech savvy. I think those are the two things that really make a difference. Brilliant. Well, with four seconds left, absolutely perfect timing again. Harim, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, thank you. So our next uh, presentation, uh, very shortly, will come from Tonu, uh, who is at the Open Government Partnership, and we'll be talking about uh, sort of open data through a gender lens and why that particularly matters in times of crisis. So hopefully any second now, the timer will reappear on my screen and we will hopefully see Tonu. Hello, Tonu, how are you? I'm well, Gavin. Thanks again for inviting us to such a great discussion. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I will now throw it over to you, and uh, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Great. I'll share my screen, and hopefully um, this should work. Great. So um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and um, give a little bit of a broad landscape, as it were, globally. Um, on why gender lens is critical uh, for data reforms as we've been discussing them. So uh, I wanna spend a minute here first on outlining the challenges and diagnosis, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A if people want to. Uh, first, I think it's important right off the bat to acknowledge that issues impact men, women, and other gender groups differently. Um, and we see this across sectors, product design, workplace culture, industry infrastructure, and across policy. And of course, there are several good books on this in case uh, people haven't read them already, happy to recommend some. Uh, the second thing is, I think that achieving gender equity requires better quality and more easily accessible data. Um, and because there is a lack of data on these challenges, there are often lack of policy measures to tackle this. Um, so, you know, one instance we've seen in our work in the Open Government Partnership and partners working on this is on a seemingly gender neutral policy issue like anti-corruption. Uh, you know, women are impacted significantly differently by corruption. A recent report by Transparency International, um, one of our partners found that women are subject to trafficking, sexual extortion, harassment by public authorities. Um, and these incidents remain underreported and untracked. And subsequently, there are weak policy measures to tackle them. Um, and this missing data um, issue on, um, on gender isn't just a developing country problem, which is often another thing we hear a lot. Um, one of our other partner organizations, Access Info Europe, just released a report last week highlighting that in the seven EU countries they examined, um, um, including the UK, um, on average, they only publish about 57% of gender-related data. And they have the whole uh, set of data they look at on this. Um, I want to situate this conversation on where we sit today and what will come after, um, in addition to all the other examples on policy areas that I want to give. Um, there's certainly a lot we don't know about COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic, you know, when this will end, how this will affect our economies. But I think as we look from our policy lens, whether it's working with um, on the economy, whether it's working on social care, um, on how will it affect women, um, other gender groups differently? And I'll touch on some of these where possible throughout the presentation. Uh, moving on from diagnosis and focusing on action, uh, you know, one of the things I want to do here is just um, suggest four ways to splice uh, how we look at gender lens and gender data needed for policy intervention, um, especially around uh, data collection, publication, and analysis. Um, where I sit is an international multi-stakeholder, multilateral partnership called Open Government Partnership, and we've been working with 78 member countries and civil society partners, and together we've seen about them make about you know, 4,000 or more commitments, as we call them. Um, and um, I, I'll illustrate some examples that we've seen over time. Um, this slide is, is talking about Break the Rolls, a gender campaign that we started last year, encouraging people to mainstream gender 
across their open government reforms. Now, in the four areas or sort of the four sets of data that I would encouraging people to think about in, in thinking through a gender lens, one is what kind of data uh, do we want that in thinking about representation and opportunity gaps? So one example I want to share is from Argentina. Uh, you know, as part of uh, their OJP uh, Open Government Partnership commitments, they wanted to look at gender disaggregated employment data, how to collect it to better understand where and how women engage in the workforce. Now, women engaging in the workforce is a huge um, issue around looking at leadership, participation, and, and uh, pay in the workforce. Um, the Another example I do want to highlight around representation and opportunity gaps is on a, a, a seemingly gender neutral policy like public procurement. Um, you know, on one hand, who uh, governments give contracts to is something more and more governments are recording and putting out there through, um, you know, their open contracting data efforts. Uh, we all know that only about 1% of contracts globally go to women-owned businesses. So Kenya is the first country in OGP that is committed to collecting gender disaggregated data on procurement, which might provide a lot of information on how to design, better design bid processes, um, you know, and where women and other communities interact with the procurement process. In thinking about the COVID crisis, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of data on, on um, employees, um, men and women who live in, uh, who work in precarious jobs and uh, how this will have how the econ economic crisis after will affect them we're also seeing data on uh, you know women uh, comprising a large percentage of health and social care workers so in thinking through what social protection measures are offered to them after it's important to think through these data gaps the second um, so the lens I'd want to think through is what kind of data is needed to tackle gender specific challenges um, one example I want to share here is from Uruguay, um, where to facilitate access to and publishing of better information on gender-based violence, um, they, they sought to publish it in open data form um, um, and provide it publicly um, uh, to uh, enable women's groups and others to uh, uh, look at advocacy issues better. Another example of, of you know, what kind of data is, is required to tackle gender-specific challenges is, of course, around gender pay gap. Um, the more information we have around salary bans, the better we will be able to close those gaps effectively, uh, both at the organization, company, and uh, macro level. The third um, I want to offer is looking at gendered impacts of specific policy. The example here I want to offer is from Canada. Um, now, Canada is implementing um, um, uh, an analysis, what they call the gender-based analysis plus, um, of uh, that looks at gender-based impacts for all budget measures as part of a broader commitment under OJP that enables citizens to better understand and track spending and procurement uh, processes through gender-based analysis, um, how it differently impacts men, women, boys, girls, and other gender groups. And then the last that I um, question I'd like to leave us to think about is how do we look at how men and women access services differently? Now, um, you know, well, one example um, I want to share is from Seoul, South Korea, where they were thinking about how to involve communities to develop uh, open subway transfer maps. And so they involve citizens groups um, and different citizens groups, um, men, women, the elderly, um, because in recognition of the fact that uh, women are able to access and use public services like transit very differently. Um, in closing, I think um, I want to think about sort of, you know, four big areas uh, that we can think through going forward as we think about data science and gender. One, how to mainstream gender into open data reforms. We're all talking about open data at the policymaker and activist level. Um, second, how to improve the use of gender data for policy, not just gender targeted, but gender um, neutral, as we like to, might like to think of them. The third is how do we look at gendered impact of policies, not just in the long term, but also upon launch and in the medium term. And fourth and lastly, really importantly, is not just look at data, but understand um, and co-create what kinds of data are important by involving women in different gender groups into conversations to see what data makes sense or not in um, thinking through long term. And that's my alarm for the time now. That was absolutely perfect, Irene Tony. Thank you very much indeed. Um, again, if you are watching 
uh, and you'd like to ask uh, Tony any questions, you've still got an opportunity to do so. You can tweet something using the hashtag IFGDataBytes, or you can also get on our Slido, uh, which is bit.ly slash SlidoDB9. And in fact, um, I'm going to start with a question from Slido. Uh, this is from uh, somebody anonymous. Um, either that or we've got a lot of people called anonymous who are asking questions today. Um, are you working with the transgender community? Do you have any projects um, or examples in that space? Thanks for that question, Gavin, and thank you, Anonymous. Um, so as OGP and I work with the Secretariat, we work with uh, different member countries, 78, as I mentioned, including local governments, uh, in helping them think through um, these policy applications. So in some of our countries, they have involved women and in, in, in different gender groups, including the transgender community, um, thinking through access to health, thinking through access to education. Um, so we have examples from countries countries like Argentina, uh, we have um, examples from countries like, um, um, uh, I think it was Uruguay actually, where we're looking at publishing data as well as uh, looking at access to services um, for these gender, different gender groups. Thank you. And um, you've mentioned sort of South America uh, quite a few times in terms of examples of countries that are thinking about this and sort of Seoul came up as well. Um, are there any other sort of success stories globally that um, the UK and others should be should be looking to or things that we should all be looking to avoid? Absolutely. So I think um, one good example, and I, I, I think I'm still curious to see how this plays out, is from Germany, so closer to the UK. Um, you know, they are looking at tracking how public and uh, gender leadership, so women and men in leadership positions in the private and public sector, collecting data, gender disaggregated data on that to inform the implementation of a policy um, in looking through uh, gender equality in positions of public and private sector leadership. So this is something they're currently implementing. So I'm curious to see how that comes about. Um, on what to avoid, I think one of the things, and this came up in, in, in some of the previous examples before, I think what to avoid is, is two things. I think one is um, thinking about gender as an afterthought, that you know whether we're looking at um, procurement, whether we're looking at uh, budgeting, uh, whether we're looking at um, corruption, thinking about these issues gender blind, as, as, as you know, we, we call it, and then thinking through, okay, then where do we, you know, where, where do we bring in the gender group, so where do we bring in the women? But actually in thinking through policy, thinking through where do I need data on, on where these impacts the different groups, where they have access to different groups, what quality these different groups uh, receive and where they can be brought in as participants um, in thinking through policy, both design as well as implementation. I think that's, that's one. And two, in especially in thinking through privacy, because data privacy is such a huge concern. Um, and we have, um, you know, we especially where, uh, and we've seen this around COVID-19, right, is where um, individuals are identified or where there's an identify identifiers at the individual level, um, it becomes extremely problematic and, and, and uh, could be misused both by the public and private sector. Great, thank you. Um, another, I mean, Anonymous is very busy tonight. Uh, we've got another one on Slido. Um, Canada's gender-based analysis of public policy sounds fascinating. Is there any evidence that has changed public policy decisions? That's a good question. So uh, Canada's gender-based policy decision um, um, tool, actually, it's a tool that they that they uh, developed a couple of years ago, and they're encouraging every every department in the Canadian government uh, to use this tool to analyze how uh, you know how this um, this is used. Now they've they've also used it as a lens in thinking through uh, you know development plans and and um, policies at the provincial level. So I think it's still too early to see whether decisions have you know what long-term impact it's had what it has done is actually think through at the at the local level at the national level where um, budgets where um, impact is um, bringing in men women and other gender groups um, in, a, in a in a meaningful way 
Thank you. Um, this one is from my colleague Katerki. I think I think it's my colleague Katerki uh, on Slido. Uh, he's actually done quite a bit of our diversity analysis of uh, UK government. Um, she asks, what are some key policy issues in the UK for which greater availability of gender related data would be useful? That's a really good question. So I think in the UK, I mean, the UK is, was one of the first, um, one of the pioneers on, on open data within OJP and some critical anti-corruption issues. Um, you know, over time, and uh, we have several partners who've done fantastic analysis on this from the open data community um, on, on how this is going. I think a couple of things that the UK could do better. One is on, on contracting because public procurement um, and, and looking at open contracting um, in the UK, um, I think looking at gender disaggregated data on, on where men and women, um, other groups receive contracts and, and making that more easily available, I think that's one. Um, second, I think there is a lot of information in, in the, around um, um, access to services. Um, and, and, you know, the UK's uh, uh, gov.uk and, and, and service uh, uh, interface, user interface is excellent. But I think providing information both uh, at the end user, so the citizen level, but also at the advocate level on services like, um, you know, licensing to taxation, I think providing that more accessible manner because that is information that they have will be very useful. The third is, I think, around anti-corruption. I think this is a big priority that we've seen, at least on the OGP side. Um, the UK government gave a lot of um, you know, uh, airtime and, and focus on, including ending anonymous companies. And I think, like I talked about procurement, this is another area, I think, the, um, in, in Italy, in OJP, actually, that's one of the first countries that's looking at um, the data in their company register um, uh, that tracks shadow companies. Um, or encouraging company ownership online um, uh, on the gender disaggregated basis. So I think putting that out would be very useful. And lastly, I think uh, at the local government level, uh, there is so much um, value that the UK and, and leadership that the UK is showing, especially on citizen engagement around innovations like Citizens Assembly. Um, and you know we've seen this around budgets, we've seen this around climate change, um, including here in London. And I think how different communities, and they've been very thoughtful in their methodology of involving different communities. Um, and we have partners like Involve um, and of course the parliament being very involved in this, in this effort. So I think looking at how different communities and gender groups have participated um, uh, out in these processes and in the outcomes coming out of it, publishing that and, and talking more about that would be very useful. Brilliant, thank you. Um, time for a very quick final question. I suppose, how optimistic are you about the, the future of the agenda? It feels like, thanks to things like the OGP Focus and Caroline Criado Perez's book, um, we are talking a lot more about data through a gender lens than, than we have done before. I don't know if, how you feel about that. Is that right? Uh, I think you're right. I mean, you know, invisible women. We, 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 I had a lot of people in our community talk about it, and I, I, I wonder though if whether still in a policy bubble, um, where people are talking about gender data and open data through a gender lens. So I think uh, I am optimistic. I think the conversation is going in the right direction. How we involve more and more communities, you know, private sector talking about it, businesses talking about it, lawyers talking about it. Um, I think that would be really the next, um, the next uh, level of conversation on this. Fantastic. Perfect timing again. Uh, Tony, that was great. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Gavin. So uh, we move to our final presentation of the evening, uh, which will be my colleague, uh, Dr. Alice Lilly, talking about uh, parliamentary data. So hopefully any moment now, Alice will appear on the screen. Hello, Alice. Hi, everyone. It's, it's nice to see Hello. you through a platform that isn't Microsoft Teams. <laughs> it makes a change, doesn't it? It does indeed. Uh, the timer will appear on the screen any moment now and uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, let me just get my presentation up for you. So there we are. So as Gavin mentioned, I would like to talk to you today about three things that I learned the hard way about parliamentary data. So I learnt about parliamentary data through this 
project that we started doing at the IFG back in 2018 called Parliamentary Monitor. And the idea of this project was to bring together lots of data about the UK Parliament and use that to try and answer some questions about how well Parliament is performing. So how well is it holding government to account, scrutinising legislation, facilitating debate? And obviously those are quite difficult and subjective questions, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, we're currently working on the second edition of this uh, project. We're hoping to publish a new edition in the next couple of months, so do keep an eye out. Um, and that also does mean that a lot of the data that you're going to see here is not up to date, uh, so do bear that in mind. Now, we were the first people to try and bring together this much data about Parliament across the same time period. Um, and it really sort of turns out that we were the first people to do this because it is in fact really difficult. There were three things that I identified as kind of the big um, difficult lessons that I learned from dealing with this parliamentary data and I'm going to come on to those in a second. But first, what did we actually do and what did we find out? So we brought together all sorts of data about Parliament and produced by both Houses of Parliament. We analysed it and we visualised it. And so we were able to answer some interesting questions. For example, how good was the government at sticking to its self-imposed target for responding to select committee reports? Well, not very. How often were MPs asking urgent questions of ministers in the House of Commons? Well, increasingly often. How much chance were MPs getting to debate pieces of secondary legislation that they were perhaps unsure about? Very, very rarely. And how much did it cost to run the UK Parliament compared to how much it cost to administer all sorts of government departments? Well, perhaps not as much as you might think. So, there was a lot that we were able to learn from using this data and pulling it together in this way. But as I said, no one had done this before because it's really hard to do. And I've learned three things about parliamentary data and about how we use and present parliamentary data. And I think it's worth saying that even though I am here talking about parliament, um, a lot of the issues that I'm going to mention are also absolutely applicable to government and I'm sure some of them will be familiar to you. So the first thing to say is that parliamentary data is really fragmented. What you're seeing on your screen at the moment is all sorts of data relating to secondary legislation. Now data is produced in relation to secondary legislation across both houses and across all sorts of parliamentary committees. And of course, that data doesn't always match. So some data might look at secondary legislation passed in a parliamentary session. Some might look at secondary legislation passed in a calendar year. And people count different kinds of secondary legislation. So what this means is that it's incredibly difficult to actually try and trace things. And you're often ended up with data sets that simply don't match. Or take this example. So here you're seeing the House of Commons and House of Lords annual reports and accounts. And you'll notice that the categories of spending included across the two houses are not quite the same. So it's not always obvious that you are comparing like with like. Now, there is good reason for all of this sort of fragmentation. Firstly, you have effectively two different institutions in the UK Parliament, the Commons and the Lords. They are run differently, they have different rules, they have different roles, so it's unsurprising that their data might differ. And then the key thing really is that in terms of everything that Parliament does, all the different groups and organisations and bodies within Parliament are always looking at things from slightly different angles. They're interested in slightly different bits of processes and procedures. So it's very understandable then that the data that they produce reflects this. 
but it also makes it very difficult for anyone to actually trace things through the data or try and sort of make robust comparisons. The second thing I learned is that parliamentary data could be much more accessible. Parliamentary Digital Service has done a huge amount of work in recent years, and we've seen some real improvements to sort of the Parliament website, and that's still ongoing. But there's more to do, and this can be pretty simple. So here is lots of data contained in things called the sessional returns. So those are big bits of uh, information that are produced by the Commons and the Lords at the end of every session of Parliament. And they contain data and statistics on absolutely everything that Parliament does. So they are an absolute treasure trove. They are also, however, PDFs. So when I first did our, our first edition of Parliamentary Monitor back in 2018, I spent hours, and I mean hours, simply putting this data into spreadsheets so I could analyze it. And those sessional returns that I just mentioned are published only at the end of every parliamentary session. So say if you were in the middle of a very, very long two and a half year parliamentary session, and you decided, as I did last March, that you wanted to calculate how long the House of Commons had spent debating Brexit in the session so far, there's no already collated data that you can use. And so, as you will see in front of you, I had to spend my time manually going through every day's Hansard and entering the amount of time spent on all the relevant bits of business. And believe me, my spreadsheet was a lot bigger than what you're currently looking at. And again, there is some good reason for some of these accessibility issues. Producing this takes up a lot of resource. Parliament needs to make sure that things are accurate um, and that the data they're producing isn't open to kind of misuse, but it makes it harder. And the final thing is a point about context. There are lots of small details that matter. The attendance of MPs on the Environmental Audit Committee might seem pretty straightforward, but look at that little note at the bottom. The Environmental Audit Committee, as it happens, is the only select committee that actually has a minister entitled to sit on it. And if you didn't know that, um, your analysis would essentially be incorrect. Now, I'm lucky that people in Parliament are incredibly helpful and friendly and will answer my questions and spot my silly mistakes, but not everyone has that to hand. Again, we've seen quite a bit of improvement here. Uh, now, if you look up the uh, voting lists after a big vote in Parliament, you will see this note on your screen reminding people that just because an MP isn't on the lists of those who voted. Uh, there might be very good reasons for that, and there are all sorts of things that they cannot control. But there is a much broader point here. Uh, I'm aware I'm running out of time, so I will be very quick. But Marie LeConte wrote this piece uh, very recently, um, where she was talking really about the importance of context. So if you're looking at uh, how an MP has voted on a particular issue, that actual piece of information doesn't really tell you very much unless you have a lot of context to it. Um, for example, you need the sort of context about how they were whipped in their party, how the issue affects their constituency, all of these sorts of things. If you don't have that context, then the information as you present it might not be as meaningful as you think. So just finally, this is a real challenge for Parliament, but it's also a challenge for all of us who use parliamentary data. How can we make that data useful and accessible, but how can we present it in ways that also preserve the necessary context, the nuance, and some of those very kind of subjective questions that I mentioned at the beginning? So as my time is well and truly up, I will finish by very conveniently posing some questions that I will not then seek to answer myself. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Alice, especially since you didn't know that you'd be doing that uh, all of two and a half hours ago. <laughs> um, as, um, as tempted as I am to start with what are our different needs when it comes to parliamentary data? How do we balance different needs of coherence? How can data be accessible in a way that doesn't remove important context? And how do we use and present data in ways that acknowledge its limitations? I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but I thought I would um, start by asking, um, 
Are there bits of good practice? Are there sort of green shoots, um, or indeed in the Lord's sort of dark red shoots, um, that we can look to for people who are trying to do this better? Um, there definitely are. Um, so something that we're kind of seeing at the moment is on the one hand, we're seeing PDS kind of continue with lots of um, aspects of improvements to the website and things. Uh, but one of the things they've done in, uh, as part of that is something called a statutory instrument tracker. So I talked in that presentation about secondary legislation and how that's a bit of a nightmare to try and wade through. Actually, PDS and Parliament have created this bit of their website where you can actually go and see information about those SIs all in one place. So I think that's uh, really positive. The other thing um, is that the House of Commons Library produces uh, things that they call parliamentary information lists which don't sound like the most fascinating things in the world, but they are incredibly useful. Um, and these are simply bits of information where they are um, these sort of lists of things. So it might be uh, lists of urgent questions or emergency debates that have happened in the house. And what's so fantastic about these is that they publish them in spreadsheet form um, and they're regularly updated. And it just means that it's incredibly easy for you to download them and do a really quick bit of analysis. Great. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, if you want to ask Alice a question, you can do so on Slido, which is bit.ly slash slidodb9, or via hashtag ifgdatabytes. Um, this is a conversation that we've had many times in the office. Um, there's there's quite a lot that, that sort of could be fixed. I mean, where, where would you start? What are the sort of easy wins, do you think, in making all of this better? So, I'm not sure how much there are easy wins um and i'm sort of tempted to answer that question with the nightmarish response of you don't really want to start from here um i think the thing to remember with parliament is that as i said the sort of ways that it deals with data have kind of grown up very organically um so every time that parliament gets a new procedure or something like that data will kind of be collected on that and what that means is that you obviously end up with quite a kind of complicated and messy system um, so I think the really kind of important thing is to actually take a big sort of step back and think about what the underpinnings are and actually how can you sort of match data to the processes um, and procedures that we know exist in Parliament. And that's an absolutely mammoth um, task. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to pretend that any of this is kind of easy, but ultimately I think that's that's really the level that you will have to start at. Uh, the organic growth of Parliament is one of the reasons why this is more difficult to have to And are there any other sort of obstacles or barriers in particular that you think are interesting why this isn't easier? I think um, another interesting obstacle, I suppose, is to think about some of the uh, cultural aspects of this. So I think it's really important that um, parliamentary staff, who have obviously huge amounts of work to do anyway, um, aren't made to feel as though sort of data collection is something that they have to do over and on top of their normal duties. I think the point is more that it's it's something that should sort of fall out of your regular activity and that it's something that you should view as useful to you in your day-to-day -day work and in your job. Um, so I think, again, sort of making sure that that culture is embedded, that data is something that is helpful that it's a part of your job it's not sort of an additional chore i think that's really important and my sense is that that is that is a cultural change that's happening um absolutely but i think obviously it's it's one of those things that does take time and again it, it also comes back to the sort of practical challenge of making sure that you have um actual systems and sort of data, data architecture in place that also support that cultural change I've heard people talk about data designed government. It sounds like a sort of data designed parliament would be uh, quite a helpful thing as well. Um, we've got another question from the prodigious anonymous on Slido. Um, do any other parliaments better use or present data on parliamentary activity? It's a really interesting question. It's not actually something that we've spent a huge amount of time looking into, although it's definitely something we'd like to do in the future. Um, I think generally, the trend is probably that the more kind of modern uh, or newer a parliament is, 
the better they tend to be at sort of collecting that data and um, publishing that data. And it, it's, again, really because they've not sort of had that same, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of sort of development of, of procedure, which means that you end up with this sort of very knotty mess of data. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm thinking in particular about the kind of devolved legislatures here in the UK. Um, there's a bit more scope, I think, for, for them to be collecting data in a way that's a lot harder for the UK Parliament. Um, I also know that we do see some of the kind of very similar um, Westminster model legislatures who do collect data on this. So we do see that in places like Australia and Canada. Um, but it's definitely something we would like to try and think a bit more about to see what lessons the UK can learn from elsewhere. So if anywhere has seen any examples of parliaments doing this very well, then please uh, do let me know. Thank you. I suppose this, this question follows on a bit from that and thinking about you know, new parliaments have had a new opportunity to do things differently. Crises could um, fulfil a similar function for existing parliaments. So I suppose in the in the light of what the coronavirus crisis has meant for the sort of workings of parliament, um, do you think there are any, I hate to use the word opportunities, but do you think there are any opportunities in improving how parliament does this side of its business? I think that's really fascinating. I mean, we're we're obviously seeing um, seeing Parliament have to respond very very quickly and adjust its ways of working in actually what are quite profound ways. Um, it will be important for them to monitor how that is working, um, and I think the Speaker has already indicated that uh, later this year there will be some kind of review into sort of how these arrangements have worked. Um, so I think that's a really important place for sort of data to, to feed in um, and help actually sort of the parliamentary authorities and the government understand how well they've, they've dealt with this. The other thing to mention here is that um, before, of course, everything was, was dominated by coronavirus, one of the things that we were thinking about a lot is um, the plans for restoration and renewal of the Palace of Westminster, um, which is still something that is coming down the track and is obviously an absolutely huge project um, and I think when you have a kind of big long-term project like that where you're actually having to physically change um, the ways that sort of parliament is working and put it in in different places there definitely is an opportunity there for them to sort of think about actually kind of designing data in uh, to what you're doing but obviously I think the coronavirus crisis will obviously take precedence over that uh, in the coming in the coming weeks and months. Um, we're pretty much out of time, so don't feel that you have to answer these questions. We can always pick them up over drinks shortly. Uh, but Matt on Slido has asked to what extent is establishing a data culture in Parliament limited by the largely non-data or non-numerate background of members uh, than officials? And Glyn asks, how much overlap is there in the Venn diagram of the hidden data architectures of Parliament and government? Oh, OK. Let me try and do those quickly. Um, so uh, kind of I think on the um, the sort of first question, um, I mean, I will uh, sort of stick up a little bit for people here in the sense that I am also a person who does not come from any kind of numerate background. I'm very much your classic um, sort of uh, history student who's been flung into doing data. So I sort of feel a bit as if I can do it. Probably anyone can. Um, I think the other thing actually as well is when we're talking about data here, there's a lot of the information that we look at and classify as data that we would not necessarily, um, other people would not necessarily always see as data. So actually, perhaps information is a better word, you know, it doesn't always have to be kind of numbers and things. So I don't think that's a huge part of it. At the same time, I would say maybe one of the issues you have in Parliament is it's a place obviously that's um, where convention and tradition um, and those sort of more qualitative things are very important. So perhaps that can be kind of one of the challenges. Brilliant. Alice, thank you very much indeed. So this is normally the uh, point in uh, a Data Bytes event where I say I am the only thing standing between you and the free drinks at our reception afterwards but you're all working from home. So I'm making no judgments. Some of you may have been playing drinking games to how often people mentioned PDF or unique open identifier. I, I don't know, and I'm making no judgments. Um, but very shortly, I will put up uh, the details on screen um, for those of you who would like to join us for drinks while I make some final uh, parish notices. So let me just do that now.
yes, if you would like to join us uh, for sort of virtual drinks um, in a few moments time, uh, then you can see the link on screen there, uh, which is bit.ly slash DB9 drinks and the password is IFGDB9. So please do uh, join us uh, for some informal chat. And a few parish notices, uh, obviously the Institute for Government, uh, this is our first uh, live online only event. Uh, sorry if there were a few technical difficulties along the way, but hopefully um, you got to enjoy our four brilliant speakers uh, this evening, largely uninterrupted. We are doing lots of other things at the moment as well, including various uh, sort of IFG live uh, discussions on everything this week from special advisors um, to civil service reform in the time of coronavirus. Uh, that will be coming out later this week, so do keep your eyes peeled for that. As I mentioned, we've published our Data Bytes report um, today, so please do take a look at that on our website, um, as well as our archive of previous Data Bytes uh, presentations. And to fi finish with some thank yous, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody at the Institute um, that made this happen today, the first time that we've ever done a live online event. A huge thank you to all of you for joining us uh, and for watching and for some brilliant questions uh, via Slido. And finally, do please join me in a round of applause uh, at your laptops um, for our four fantastic speakers today. Thank you very much indeed. Hopefully see you for drinks in a few minutes and uh, hopefully see you on the 6th of May for the next Data Bytes. Thank you very much indeed.